Well, welcome once more to the Delos workshop. I've been asked this time if I could speak on using hand tools really aimed at people who've just started or just starting. I'm not really sure that I'm the best person to do this because I've been using hand tools ever since I could stand up really, but I will give it a go and uh, really what I'd like to do is share with you some of the things I've learned along the way. Now one of the adages that you will have heard is bad workman always blames his tools. I think this is really unfair actually to the point of being wrong because if you've got poor tools even a good workman is not going to get on very well. So good tools are important. Now I think it's worth aiming for good tools in the long run because if you keep buying cheap you'll keep buying often. Now it is true that you may need to buy cheaper at first because you can't afford anything else but I do think it's worth planning for something better in the longer run. Now as a rule of thumb, bearing in mind that we're none of us professionals, probably as a price guide I tend to aim for the sort of the middle, sorry the top of the middle third when it comes to pricing your tools. Right let's start with hammers because um, we all use hammers but in my view they're used rather too often certainly in um, working with O-gauge. Now we'll take as an example here um, and I've made a large one so we can see what's going on, a pin that needs to be uh, pushed into this aluminium block. Now this could be a piece of etch and a much smaller piece of wire of course. Now the temptation I know for many people would be to take that and just um, knock it in. Not really the best way of doing it and certainly not on a stringy surface like this. Something underneath with a bit of weight to back up would be a good idea. And obviously if the pin is going to go the right way through, it would be a good idea to have something with a bit of weight and a hole in it so you can knock the pin through. But actually, even if you use a hammer, it would be far better to take a punch and hit the punch with the hammer. Now a punch doesn't have to be a commercial punch like this and it doesn't have to be as big. It could be just a lump of brass, which would probably be better in many ways because it wouldn't damage the brass pin. But that's all very well. It's far better rather than to hammer it in, to squeeze it in. This way you've got much more control. Now there's a very nifty tool called parallel pliers and I find these extremely useful because you've got so much control over the squeeze. Very nice. Now clearly this is too big for using the parallel pliers so it's not a problem. We just move over here and we take the vise. So there's the pin. It's in a hole that's just slightly large to top to make sure that it starts properly and we get the vise and it's nice and easy we just squeeze the pin in and oh, even the vise moves around I've just moved it here from somewhere else it doesn't have to be a precision vise just an old vise like this one will do and you can very gently control what you're doing and there we are one pin pressed in a hole without the use of a hammer I mentioned a punch earlier, this one here, which is actually 3 16 on the end, and most model engineers would consider this quite small. But of course, from our point of view, that's really quite big. And even punches down at this sort of size are sort of normal size, whereas model engineers could consider them absolutely tiny. But we'll start with these because they're big enough to see what's going on. The simple punch, parallel end, flat on the end. And you can get these in different sizes. You can also get them with a depression on the end. Now, strictly speaking, these are nail sets for driving panel pins in, but I find them quite useful for punching in rods that um, aren't too big, and then the punch won't slip off the end. Another sort of punch you might well come across is a centre punch, and I'll talk a little bit more about these later on when we're doing marking out. But it is essentially just a punch with a conical end with a reasonable point on. Now, you can buy all sorts of punches in different shapes and sizes, and you do have to have them reasonable. They're hardened, usually, so that um, you, know, you don't damage the ends. But sometimes it's very important not to damage what you're working on, and so I've got a set of brass punches. Um, same sort of idea, but made of brass. And if you don't use them in too onerous situations, you don't damage the end. But for most things in you know, O-gauge, those punches are quite big. And I find that I'm finish up wanting something much smaller. Now I made these punches and you could make your own and they're not that difficult, they don't have to be quite like this. And I've used the shank end of worn drills. They're just a piece of steel 
and the drill is set in, in this case in a brass ferrule, because it's much easier to drill a small hole in the brass and then fit the brass into the steel. But um, here are a couple where I've gone straight into the steel. But you can just take a piece of steel, drill a hole, and then glue in or use a Loctite the end of a drill. And they're hardened, so they should be up to the job of knocking things. But then you have to be careful not to break them off as well. But I find these little punches extremely useful, particularly for knocking out pins and things that are in the hole that they shouldn't be. Okay, let's move on to screwdrivers. Again, a common tool that everybody uses. Um, we're all familiar with the DIY flat-ended screwdriver. And more recently, of course, we've all come across, now then, the Posi drive, the Phillips, they're all cruciform drives. And they're not the same. And I don't know about you, but I know Phillips and Posi drive screws are identified as different, but I always take the screw find a screwdriver and make sure that it's a jolly good fit. Now this principle is exactly the same when it comes to working with much smaller screwdrivers. Now I've had a set of screwdrivers both um, flat-ended and cruciform for many years and they weren't expensive and they do seem to have last, lasted quite well so perhaps this is a case where you don't have to have the very best if you don't overdo it. We start off with the flat-ended screwdrivers, range of sizes, and it's surprising how large a screwdriver you can use for the job. And in fact, they go the other way around. People have a tendency to use one that's too small and they chew up the heads of the screw. Now I'll pick up here this 10BA screw, and notice it is a screw, not a bolt. You look at those screwdrivers there, and you would think, oh, somewhere around here. But actually, if I take the very largest one and put it, it fits perfectly into the slot there. Now it's wider than the screw, so that's a problem. You may need to go down to a smaller one. But that would be the screwdriver that ideally drives that 10BA screw. Now actually, I have an even bigger jeweler screwdriver here, and that fits just as well. So I'd be just as well off using that one. Now just a word about jeweler screwdrivers. They've got this handy little uh, rotating bit at the back, which when you're using the screwdriver means it's not trying to bore a hole in your hand. So I'd definitely recommend using jeweler screwdrivers rather than just small versions of conventional hand screwdrivers. When it comes to the cruciform screwdrivers, again, they've got this little revolving piece and so on. I really don't like cruciform screws. And of course, these days in no-gauge models, we come across so many of them that have been assembled in the Far East. And the screws and their heads don't seem to conform to any standard particularly. So what I finish up doing is finding the screwdriver that best fits, and making sure it is a good fit, I'm doing the best I can, but if there's the slightest suggestion that it's going to slip out or start chewing up the screw head, I just reach for the Dremel tool with a small slitting disc in that's probably one that's well worn down, and I file a slot, across, grind a slot across the end, and then we're back to the sort of screwdriver I do know how to use. Even then, the screws can break up when you finish up having to drill them out. So that's screwdrivers. If we move on now to Allen keys, clearly what we have here is a piece of bar, a hexagon profile, and it fits into a hexagon hole in the head of a screw, and we can use it to do and undo the screw. Now, as with screwdrivers, it's important you use the right one for the job. Now, there are nominally two sorts of Allen key, metric and imperial, but even so, you do need to find the right one. It's quite easy. You just pick up an Allen key and try it until you get one that's a really good fit. Now, having said that, if you look at these smaller Allen keys here, at first sight they all look the same if not just perhaps very similar but they're not they're different and often the trouble starts with the slater screw which is a 6ba countersunk screw that holds the driving wheel onto the end of an axle and they have very tiny hexagonal sockets and it's very easy to use the wrong allen key and machine them out round it's also very easy to have um, a cheap allen key which uh, itself goes round so when it comes to allen keys, particularly in the smaller sizes, it's important you do have decent ones that are hard and are hexagonal and the right size. And when you get down to very tiny ones like this, and I really don't like using them, it's very important that you have the right one for the job. So there we are, allen keys. Let's move on to saws and we'll start with the junior hacksaw, which we're all familiar with. Now I find a junior hacksaw actually really difficult to steer and then sort of keep it up against the line. And the reason is, I believe, that instead of having 
teeth which are individually set left and right and left and right as you would have on a wood saw they've just got wavy teeth and they're sort of wave from the left to the right and the left to the right so there isn't a proper set on it but they are useful for roughing out and cutting out big pieces of stuff mostly though I like to use a back saw now um, this one is uh, an exacto and I'm sure you recognize the handle at least and they're perfectly okay for cutting plastic and brass they really don't last very long anything um, tougher than that or nickel silver is okay but steel <clears throat> forget it now here's another back saw with um, changeable blades actually made by Eclipse and these blades are absolutely the bee's knees for cutting anything so I tend to use this one there are some advantages in having this deep blade here with a very thin back and I'll demonstrate using this um, <clears throat> a little bit later on but with these um, back saws usual sort of thing put the teeth in make sure you get them the right way around most of the time you want to cut on the push stroke but there are times cutting thin tube for example when it's preferable to put the blade in the other way around and cut on the pull stroke now these back saws are useful for cutting straight lines and you get more complicated shapes which we most often do and that's when we come to um, the piercing saw or the coping saw now there's very little difference between the two in fact this is a piercing saw because the frame length is adjustable I think one of the reasons is that the blades are so fine and they're very easily broken <clears throat> it's handy to be able to shorten the frame so you can use the short bits of blade but either way um, it is important that you get the teeth in the right way around so that they're cutting on the pull stroke we use this in a v-shape mount on the bench and again i'll demonstrate this in the next video coping saw <clears throat> exactly the same idea typically it's used in woodworking and it has um, larger teeth but it's the same animal now sometimes this bit of throat here isn't large enough and so we sort of move to the cousin which is the fret saw uh, now this case you have to pull the <coughs> two arms together clamp the blade and you've got a very sort of unwieldy tool but it does allow you to deal with big sheets of things and that I think is saws just demonstrate something here that you can do quite well with a backing saw which you certainly wouldn't want to do with a hacksaw. Now I've got a piece of etch in the vise and it's actually marked out and I want to saw that top bit off. Now with a hacksaw this the teeth will actually rip up the vise but with a back saw that there are no set on the teeth will cut this quite nicely. It's quite a fine bladed saw actually so it's taking me quite a while. But that's just the principle. If you've got a thin piece that you're taking off it's best to be the scrap because it can start curling but um, it's quite an easy way to hold it and then when you're finished you can just wipe over the top with a file. I mentioned the coping saw and the piercing saw earlier here's an example of using in this case the piercing saw we have a piece of hardboard aluminium would be nice cut in a V usually with a hole in the end and to cut off a small piece Mark it out and then very carefully, taking nice long even strokes, just use the saw, keep up towards the line and eventually given time you can remove the piece and then clean up with a file. Now sometimes you need to remove a piece out of the middle of the piece that you're working on in which case you, in this case, drill a couple of holes, pass the blade through the holes and set it up again in the saw, and then you can work again very gently from the inside until eventually you cut out the piece you want. That's actually a piercing saw, very useful device. Let's move on to files then. I think this is really a good example of where buying quality tools really pays off. Now, the thing about files <coughs> is they only cut when they're sharp and for brass and nickel silver you really need new files and here is a set of files different sizes different cuts <coughs> when they're no longer cut brass so well they can cascade down and it'll still cut steel perfectly well sounds counterintuitive but brass and nickel silver are very slippery steels and the file starts to slide over still okay for brass uh, sorry for steel got another set of files here which was actually um, <clears throat> given to me at a model engineer exhibition because they're really very cheap 
They're um, the sort of thing you might find at a model railway exhibition. They are brandy, but I don't know what they are. And I just use them for filing white metal or anything odd, but they're not really very good files. <clears throat> I always go to uh, the watchmaker or the jewellery or the clockmaker trade when it comes to um, tools like this, and I can recommend cousins, as in your aunt and uncle's children. Cousins. Look it up on the internet. There's a host of tools that are useful for us, and they're not all really expensive. <clears throat> now, the files I've got here are obviously um, sort of fairly large by no gauge standards, and we've all got needle files that come in various um, cuts and shapes, all very useful. But very often, <clears throat> it's necessary to go down to really small needle files, and I've got a precious set here which really are tiny, and I can't find them anymore. You have to be really careful with them because you can imagine it doesn't take much to break them off. And I've got one here that had a little handle and I did break it off. But the bit that's left is very useful. So tiny needle files. Now, <clears throat> one of the things people ask me is about cleaning the files. And the way to do this, if you've got it clogged with white metal, is to take a piece of brass and just literally work along the grooves in the file. <clears throat> Maybe both ways, but once you've started, a piece of brass will pick up the pattern of the grooves and it'll become much easier to push the pieces out. What I would avoid doing at all costs is using a file cleaner or a file guard. This is a bit of an <coughs> ancient um, tool here. Uh, looks like a bit of rough doormat and it murders files, it really does. It's all right perhaps for a big DIY file or a um, blacksmith's file. It's even got a little tool here that you can use to pick out individual bits to the clog the file. It's all very well as a sort of a show and tell antique, but really not the place in a uh, model maker's workshop. So there we go, files. Right, let's have a look at pliers. Again, pliers come in all sorts of shapes and sizes and they're the sort of things we've all got. Probably the most useful universal when we're doing O-gauge is a pair of fine nose pliers like this. You can't do everything with them. It is useful also to have some smooth jawed pliers. These come to a point. These are also quite handy, the ones smooth with sort of wider jaws. And of course the round nose pliers are very useful for forming things, particularly um, bending links. But we've also got specialist pliers which are sometimes useful to reaching in awkward places. The one thing I like about some of these pliers is they've got springs in that open the jaws and so it's much easier. With an ordinary pliers you have to somehow sort of one finger in and work like this and you do get used to it. One specialist plier, which is quite useful, is a jeweller's plier. And you can see it's got two round jaws, in this case of different sizes, and you can get them in steps as well. But they're parallel, unlike the ordinary um, round nose pliers. And this way you can sort of form perfect links. Quite useful, a bit specialist, but again, they're sprung. And finally, the parallel pliers, which I mentioned in connection with the hammers. Um, these, as the name implies, keep the jaws parallel. Now that's really useful for a number of things. I do use them for squeezing things together, but even when you've got to just hold something like a plate, like this, in these parallel pliers, they're held right the way along, and you can hold on to it and work on it. It's very rigid. As I'm sure you know, if you take an ordinary pair of pliers and you get hold of a plate like this, it's not only being held at the top, it's not being held at the top at all, and it's very easy for it to wobble about and you finish up trying to compromise. You don't need to compromise with these. Get hold of it, and you've got it. So there we are, a little bit on pliers. Let's turn to side and end cutters then. Now, um, side cutters or wire cutters, that you'd often think of them, it's very common, buy them in DIY stores, and they're excellent for cutting off wire. Not too bad for cutting off larger stuff, but... Um, <clears throat> When you get something a bit finer, this is the sort of thing you want. Lovely tool, this. Actually, the jaws are box forged one in the other, so they're very, very precisely controlled. Very little on the end there, so when you cut the wire off, it cuts it off very cleanly, and it's got a spring, so it's um, self-returning. So those are quite nice for small jobs. <clears throat> Many people on come with the Zuron cutters. Um, <laughs> I think most popular for cutting off double O rail, but it seems a bit vicious for that, but it does do it. One of the things about them is that the blades almost line up, not quite. They are still shears, but when you have a cut on this side, 
the cutter is relatively clean. So there's your Zuron cutters, and they do come in different sizes and so on, but that's basically what it is. <clears throat> also very useful is end cutters. Now sometimes you can't get these in because they're in the way of something else, or you just can't get them down flat. Now the end cutters, on the other hand, you can come in on top and crop off what it is that's too long. And also with this particular set, they are perfectly smooth there. So when you crop off your pin or wire, whatever, although it makes a bit of a mess of the one that's coming off, it leaves a very clean cut on the piece that's left behind. So there we are, side nail cutters. Well, here we are with pin vices and pin chucks. This is a pin vice, I know it's a bit confusing because it looks like a chuck. We have four little jaws there and we can put a drill in, for example, nip it up and then we're free to start drilling. I find one thing that's very useful is just take an old drawing pin, put it in the back like that, and then when you put it in your hand, just like the jeweler screwdriver, you can drill away without it boring a little hole in your finger on the back of your hand. So pin vices come in various sorts of sizes. Now a pin chuck is actually very similar, and here's one. Again, it's got, uh, in this case, replaceable collets for different sizes, and we can put this in, well now, a drilling machine or a lathe, and the principle is really that it allows you to hold very much smaller drills. Um, this one I think is down to 0.5. This one closes down to practically nothing. So there we are, pin vices and a pin chuck. When it comes to vices, you've seen the old vice that I um, use on my bench for everyday work and I don't mind knocking lumps out of it. But uh, it might be worth moving on to something a little bit more elaborate. These are actually machine vices and this is a really very nice one. It has grooves in here that allow you to clamp it down to the bench or to the milling table. Or if you've got a big vice, you can actually put it in the vice and hold it. The thing about this is the jaws are really solid, as you can see, and they're really well guided, so they stay parallel and they um, don't let things move about. The vertical V here and the horizontal V here allows you to hold round or hexagonal stuff, um, horizontal or vertical. I've got a smaller example, which... Um, it's really just a small brother of that one. There are two other machine vices here. These are actually from the Unimat and I use them on the milling machine. And they come ready with a T-bar going into the slots. It's got a horizontal and a vertical V-notch as before, but I don't find that terribly useful, especially not in the Unimat, because those are quite large. So I turn the jaw round and have the smooth sized. And that's much more useful, I find. There's also this little chap, which uh, everyone should have one of these. It's a little vice, as you can see, and it's on a ball swivel here, so you can put it at whatever angle you like, just nip it up, and then this goes in the bigger vice, and you can have this at whatever angle you like. And it's quite a useful thing, sort of thing to have. But uh, just a machine, just a vice that clamps onto the, onto the bench or onto the desk is a useful thing to have, and I don't really think many people would manage without one. When I was talking about vices, one thing I didn't talk about was a hand vice, which perhaps uh, might be worth mentioning now. <clears throat> As its name suggests, you use it in your hand and it's very useful for holding onto, in this case, perhaps a piece of etch and do it up tightly and you can sort of attack it with a file. This is quite an old one actually, given to me by a well-respected model engineer and I'm very fond of it. But a more modern one, exactly the same thing. This one made by Eclipse looks something like this. This one actually has a little V-notch groove here which can be useful for holding round stuff and stop it twiddling backwards and forwards, but I must admit I never missed it when I used this one. So hand vice. Right, time for spanners. Now, most of the spanners we use are small in the um, 6, 8, 10BA, smaller 12BA range. And the typical spanner that you'd buy, and this is actually quite a good one, they seem to think that we talk up our nuts that are ridiculous. I don't know how you're supposed to use something like this. This is actually a three millimeter spanner, but they're just the same in the BA sizes. This one here is a six BA, I suppose that's not too unreasonable, but I have no problem at all just taking the file to them. They're usually quite soft in these sizes and cutting them down to so you can get them into the job. And here's a 10 BA where I did the same sort of thing. Um, it's more like a sort of spanner shaped spanner. An even smaller one. This is just a cheap pressed spanner actually and I filed that one down. Um, definitely worth doing. I mean the tools are for doing a job. I don't think they're sacrosanct. I have made spanners. This is a nice little 10BA spanner. It's to get into nuts in awkward places. 
12 ga spanner same idea just take a piece of rod bend it bash it file it and you've got a little 12 ga spanner because we're not doing them up awfully tight now ring spanners in small sizes are pretty rare actually um, but not difficult to make this is a 10 ba ring spanner which i made just a piece of brass hex um on the end of a piece of steel soft soldered on to be a bit careful because this one the rod doesn't go right through but this one goes right through so you can actually talk it up quite well with that of course after ring spanners we move on to box spanners and again the manufacturers seem to think that we're going to talk them up this is which one is this this is the uh, 8ba and i've just machined the end down so that you can get it on and not foul with the one next to it and i did the same thing with the uh, the 10 and the 12 so that they're sort of more like to get on the job now this is a one from an american set and they've got the right idea they've combed it down so that it's only slightly larger i don't know why people don't do that automatically again you can make your own now this probably needs a lathe but not necessarily and the trick here is to take a socket head screw i've got one here that's large enough so you can just see what it is and find one that fits on the nuts that you want and then you drill a hole in the piece of steel this is where you need the lathe machine the thread down so that it's probably half the size and then force it onto the end of the piece of steel or use loctite put it back in the lathe and then machine away all the head that you don't want and you finish it up with them um, little socket spanners and i use these all the time because you want to be flashy then put them turn around in the lathe and put a piece of nerving on the back but you really don't need to that sockets and lastly we come to peg spanners now as the name suggests they've got little pegs on the end here we are two pegs sticking out or you can go on at the end two little pegs sticking out and i use these mostly on the top hat bearing bushes that come with slater's wheels where you need to recess them into the front um, coupling rod typically on a jubilee is the one in old quotes because then you can put them in and twiddle them right the way in and they've sunk themselves down below the rod now i know other people said oh well, you can just file flats on and indeed you can but you have to have a little bit sticking out for that so i quite like peg, peg spanners and i've made them for other people as well i'm going to talk about brooches used for opening up holes in a minute but before we do that let's just have a look at drills very quickly because you've got to have a hole to start with now here you can see a set of drills from quite small at 1.6 down to 0.35 which is really very small indeed and they come in this handy dandy pack and i would say the pack is the most useful thing about it because when you buy them for, for i don't know five eight pounds something like that the drills are pretty useless um i would always go online and to a specialist and i can recommend the drill service the drill service you can look them up online anything about the drill services when you go into this website it's like being dropped in a big city department store when you've ever been to the village shop before it's quite awesome you're looking for jobber drills hss high speed steel jobber drills and when you find them a uh, typical drill one millimeter in diameter would be one pound eighty maybe two pounds um, and that's the sort of price you should be paying for drills they're sharp they're hard and they stay that way i would not buy them from model railway exhibitions the only exception to that would be phil at hobby holidays i wouldn't mind buying drills from him but everybody else the drills come in boxes like this they're cheap nasty and you break them easily and you have to buy another one and another one and another one so like files it's not worth skimping when it comes to drills so drills having drilled a hole it's often necessary to open it up now i wouldn't overdo doing this but for etches and thin sheet a five-sided brooch is the tool for the job now i've got a big one here just so you can see and it cuts on the sharp bits here now because it's at such a large angle it's sort of scraping the material away so it does cut but it's got a very low rake to sharpen them it's one of the great things actually this is actually a um, diamond lap but you can use an ordinary stone you just literally just run along the flat edge and as you do that it cleans up the sharp edge here now usually brooches come in sets they're sort of bigger down to smaller and smaller and even smaller they really are something that needs a handle or you have to hold them in a pinch up they're quite uncomfortable to hold and twist in a hole if you haven't got something to get hold of them with don't overdo it though drill a hole the right size to start with and then just open it up a bit now for bearings the brooch leaves not an unreasonable finish actually but there's also a smoothing brooch and this is a large one used by clockmakers. they don't actually take any material off at all because you can see they're quite it's perfectly smooth 
little drop of oil in the hole, twiddle it round and round and round, and it just smooths off the high ridges and pushes them into the low troughs until eventually you finish up with a really, really smooth um, hole. I say for clocks and bear for bearings in clocks, it's quite important, probably less so in our case, but they're nice to have. Um, mounted in the handle, come in a range of sizes, there's just three there. Let's look at deburring, and those of you who have read the February Gazette and have delved into the inner pages will have seen all this, but here we go. Now, a piece of plastic card has been cut, and a simple matter of taking a scalpel and running it on the edge like that, very nicely cleans up fuzzy edges. Same sort of thing with a piece of brass or nickel silver, scalpel won't cut it. Fine file, sharp, just run along the edge like this and it'll take off any raggedy bits. That's straight bits. When it comes to um, deburring a hole, you've often got rough bits in a hole, I find a worn drill, and I've just mounted two small ones here in a piece of dowel, run those in the hole and it'll take out the corner. Worn drills so that they don't try and bite in and just cut a bigger hole. If you've got the thing on a larger size, it works just as well with a worn drill without having a handle on, just never got round to it. If the holes start to get larger, then you can buy commercial deburring tools. And this is actually a countersinking tool, but it works very well, um, particularly on the lathe, the large holes. Larger again, and you can get commercial scrapers, three-sided scraper, although I've made one here out of a, um, again, the back end of a broken drill, centre drill actually, um, and that's useful for scraping round um, large radius holes. But I must say, my find of the century are these little chaps, and these are concave cup cutters, deburrers that cut on the outside, and these, difficult to see, but you'll have to imagine, or look in the Gazette, these are little cups that are cut with teeth on the inside of the cup, and they're extremely useful, I find, for deburring little pieces of wire that are sticking out of, say, a buffer beam and rep to represent uh, bolt heads or rivets, because I finish up, or did, chasing around all the bits with the file trying to get rid of them and at the best you've got a flat-ended representation of rivet whereas these they whip off the furry bits without any trouble and they put a nice chamfer on and you have a nice dome rivet shaped looking piece of wire. Now if you're wondering where these marvellous concave cup cutters come from um, they come from cousins again uh, as I mentioned with the files <coughs> it's mentioned in the Gazette and you can get up online cousins, as in the children of your aunt and uncle. These are all less than two millimetres, and they're also less than two pounds each. I've mounted them in a dowel, because it's easy to get hold of, but you don't have to. You can mount them in a pin chuck, or you could even put them in the drill press. But they really are great. Right, let's have a little look at scrapers. Now, I don't use scrapers very often, but uh, here's one that I made out of punch just ground the end down. Now the thing is the end needs to be sharp but not pointed if that makes sense. There's actually a flat on the end. Now the, for those of us who haven't discovered invisible solder it's quite useful to have a tool like this that you can just come in and gently scrape from side to side and gradually remove that solder. Now it's a lot better not to put too much solder on in the first place. But sometimes you get it where you don't want it. This one I say I made from an old punch. But when I was a teenager, I didn't have any old punches, so I made this one from a bicycle spoke. It works quite well. Heat it up red hot, then bash it with a hammer, and then grind it until um, it's a little sort of scraper. And it does the same sort of thing. So I say, um, when I was a teenager, <laughs> I definitely haven't found the invisible solder. So anyway, to sharpen these things, I tend to use a um, diamond stone. Um, but you, an ordinary stone would do just as well. Now what you're after is to sharpen it like this, and again like this. But when you're done, just very carefully take the point off it. And in that way, the end is still sharp, but it's not pointed. And in that way, there is far less chance that the scraper will dig into the brass, which is what you really don't. Turning now to taps and dies, and I realise that's not everybody's idea of a hand tool, but we'll look at it just quickly. Now a tap, and we have three of them here, is essentially a device for putting a screw thread on the inside of a hole. And it is normal to uh, have three in a set. This one known as a taper, this one known as a second, 
and this one known as the plug. Now the taper, as you can see, it has quite a long taper on so that when you start cutting the thread in the hole, you're not trying to cut, the, cut it all at one go. The second has a much sharper taper on the end so that it just cleans out and actually sizes the hole, but it is cutting pretty much all the way along. Now, very unusually, I would say, and best avoided, is tapping down to the end of a blind hole. Not to be encouraged, but a plug tap is literally cut off flat at the end and it really only cuts on the first one or two lands there. Now to hold the tap, I know you very often see in the largest sizes a tap wrench, which essentially grabs hold to the square end of the tap like that, and then you can wind it into the hole. And that's all very well in a larger tap, but of course what you do want to just twist it and not put any side forces on it. And that takes a little bit of skill, especially with smaller taps. I think it's just not worth risking. So I've got a um, pin vise here, which is actually a tap pin vise with a Tommy bar across. And this is a much better bet to put it in the end. And uh, with the two like that, you kind of much better chance of being able to keep it at right angles to what you're doing and also not twiddling it backwards and forwards. Now it's much easier if you've got a drilling machine. You don't do it under power, but you can use the drilling machine to hold the tap absolutely upright. So there are taps and two tap wrenches. Similarly, a die puts the thread on the outside. Now the only thing that I would say about this is, it's always good practice to put the die inside the die holder. Now you can just hold the die holder and twiddle it round this rod that you're trying to put a thread on. There's always a danger there because it's quite weak here and here, and I have seen many broken dies where it hasn't been put in the holder and just getting to the end of the job and somebody has just gone, oh, just one more turn and crack and that's it. If you put it in the die holder, then not only can you put this screw in and open the die up a little bit within the holder and cut the thread, and then if you try the nut or whatever's going on, it's a bit tight, you can back this screw off a little bit, tighten up these two screws, and the die will close down. Always there's a limit because there's a slot here and it closes right up. That's as far as it should go. But within that range, you should have the right thread. The other thing I would say is do make sure that whatever it is that you're trying to put the thread on is sufficiently small. The don't, you don't need the full thread depth. So err on having the thing too small rather than too large, because if it shears off and it's very easily done in brass, then some very unparliamentary language can follow. And what you have to do is take one of your back saws, preferably not a good one, and then cut down that slot and through the sheared off piece of whatever you've got in there and try and fiddle it out. Best avoided. So always put it in the die holder and also make sure that you're not trying to take too much off. Now the die has a taper in this direction. So you start using the face of the die that's actually got on the um, description, John, 4BA in this case. If you really do need to screw right up to a shoulder or a head, and you can turn the die round and just clean up from the back. Now this isn't brilliant because there's no relief on the thread in that direction and it is cutting all at one go so you need to be very careful doing that but sometimes you do need to do it. So that's taps and dies except that in this particular set here it goes down to 14 BA. I've inherited this from my father and he used it a lot on steel so I keep my own set just for brass because taps that have been used a lot on steel are really difficult in brass because they're tight and they don't like to cut. Also down at this end, I don't go down below 16BA, even 16BA is a bit small for me, but I did purchase once at a model, railway ex a model engineer exhibition this wonderful set of taps and dies and they go down to, I cannot believe it's small. Now I very rarely use them to actually make screw threads, more likely I use them for what you might call ornamental screw threads on models where you can see um, a bit of thread. So there we are, tamps and dice. Now two tools that I really couldn't do without are the calipers and the micrometer. Now these days you can buy digital uh, calipers that are relatively inexpensive and the idea is you slide them in and out and you can measure things on the outside. There we go, 9.51. And you can measure, using the other jaws, things on the inside. 12.64, call that half an inch. And that's very useful. Now I would only use the calipers just to check is that big enough 
9.5. Yes, if I'm making something I want to be about 9 or even 8 millimetres in diameter, that's perfect. But once I've started machining, then I would take the micrometer. Just wind this on here. And sure enough, 9.51. Exactly the same as the vernier calipers. Now the micrometer, if you've not seen one before, it's very simple. It's just a screw thread inside, very accurately made. And as you twizzle this around here, the numbers disappear. And each turn, in this case, is 0.5 millimeter. So you just read here, read there, and that is the diameter that you're measuring. Now, you can still buy relatively expensive. It is a sort of a digital caliper, I suppose, and that there's digits on it. Um, this sort of thing, exactly the same. A little bit more tricky to read. It doesn't come out. What you really need to be clever with is the vernier calipers. And if you've got vernier calipers and you don't know how to use them, I suggest you just go onto YouTube because it's not worth me trying to describe it here. Um, on the only cheap set that I've got. So there you are, calipers, micrometer. Now one of the areas that always seems to cause um, a bit of a problem is that of marking out and marking out holes especially in the right place so you can drill them correctly. Now it isn't actually that difficult. There's two, one, two ways I'll just show you. One is using the calipers and I'm not going to take anything special but you could put say six millimeters there and we take it away from that edge and that's made a line. And let's say we want it eight millimeters from this edge, close enough. And there now we make another line. Now if you've done it sufficiently carefully, it should be possible to pick up the scriber, which is just, um, what shall we say, looks like a punch with a point on, and then very carefully feel along the line until you come up to the cross line. And then if you sort of give it a bit of a push and a bit of a twiddle, you can finish up with a little point, uh, sorry, a little hole. Now that's made with the point of the scriber. That's nothing like big enough to uh, drill from. So either then you use a center punch, which I showed you earlier, to go in the indentation, and then you uh, give it a, <coughs> a tap with a hammer bigger than that, or I've got an automatic center punch, which essentially is a spring-loaded point. And again, you can feel your way along find the interchange, press, and it fires, and it's made a little point. Now that's only a very small one, and if you're drilling, say, a 0.5 millimeter hole, it was big enough. But if you've got something a bit more on your hands, and um, you can wind the center punch up a little bit, put it like that, and then, and it gives a much, uh, <clears throat> yes, a much bigger punch hole to start with. So that's okay. If you're having to mark out what you're doing with a ruler, it's really no different. You do all your measuring, Use the scriber to draw the line. Another one here. And just as before, you very gently move the scriber along and you can feel where the cross line is. Do that and you're away. So that's how I do my marking out. And it's a good idea to mark out twice or even three times and then drill or saw once. Um, it's very easy to lose a millimetre or add one or to think you're putting a line in the middle but actually you didn't divide in your head correctly, just measure it a couple of times before you start cutting metal. A couple of things just to finish up with. When I was talking about the um, importance of being careful how to turn the taps, I did mention the tap wrench with the T-bar, but I forgot to mention for a smaller tap, and this is 10 BA, so it's not really very small, a pin vise is the, um, the ideal thing, because that way you stand some chance of just sort of twiddling and keeping it under control. And the last thing I'd like to say, <clears throat> we've been looking at hand tools and I hope that's been helpful, but of all the things of hand tools, it's best not to abuse them, but if they do get damaged, you can always buy another one. But the one thing you can't buy any more of is your hands. So do look after your hands.